Okay, um, chapter 15, uh, is general properties of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that uh, is going to help us control many things that we have in which we don't have that much control over them. Even though there's some control, but we voluntarily do not control this uh, type of nervous system. Uh, for example, one of the most important things is, is going to provide us visceral reflexes. Visceral reflexes, like for example, in the case of uh, high blood pressure, when you have high blood pressure, you don't voluntarily or consciously you don't reduce your blood pressure, right? That is done using reflexes controlled by the autonomic nervous system. As you can see here, an increase in blood pressure is captured by the receptors that you have in the blood vessel. That information is sent to your brain. In particular, your uh, brain stem, and from there, the heart rate is reduced in order to reduce the blood pressure. So that's an example of a visceral reflex. And again, we don't have you know, voluntarily control over these things. So if we keep scrolling down, divisions of the autonomic nervous system, there are two main divisions. One of them is the sympathetic nervous system, and the other one is the parasympathetic nervous system. Right here, you can see parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. We scroll down, we said autonomic output pathways. And here they are comparing the autonomic nervous system with the somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system, you just have one nerve that is going to help you control your muscles. In the case of the autonomic nervous system, there are actually two nerves. You have the preganglionic fiber and the postganglionic fiber. Right here, this is a ganglion where the synapse between the preganglionic fiber and the postganglionic fiber are going to make the synapse. So the most important thing to remember about the autonomic nervous system is that there is a synapse before the nerves get in contact with the organ. Okay, so let's keep scrolling down. And that's about it. Even though they are showing here some comparison between somatic and autonomic, this is something that you don't necessarily have to know. Okay, the next topic in this chapter is anatomy of the autonomic nervous system. We said we have two divisions. The first one is the sympathetic division. You scroll down. You can see this figure right here. And some characteristics that you're going to see is the sympathetic starts right here in your thorax, in the lumbar area. See, and the top and the very bottom, they're not occupied by the sympathetic. So since we have two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic, the sympathetic is very, going to be basically thoracic, and the parasympathetic, you will see that, is going to be basically on the top, cranial, and sacral right here at the bottom. Okay? You're going to see that in a little bit. Now, if you look right here at the thoracic area, you're going to see two fibers, because we said that we have a synapse right here in the ganglion. The preganglionic, in this case, is green, and the postganglionic, in this case, is red. The preganglionic is short, the green one is short if you look at the if you compare that with the red that's very important because that's an anatomical difference comp when comparing sympathetic with parasympathetic okay so then the pre the uh, preganglionic is short and the postganglionic is long but you will see here that the postganglionic you see fibers on the top fibers in the middle fibers at the bottom because the postganglionic can actually get three different routes. It can go to the top, it can go straight to the abdomen, or right here to the bottom. Okay, so we're going to see that in a little bit. So you scroll down. Right here you have a here again, right, the spinal cord. This is preganglionic in green, and here you can see the three pathways that it can take. Remember I showed you that. To the top, for example, to the iris and the salivary glands. Straight goes to your abdomen, to the sweat glands, for example, the pylorectal muscle in your abdomen and goes down, to, for example, to your liver and your spleen. That is the sympathetic. If you scroll down, and here you have the three numbers, one, two, three, again, because of the three different ways that it can go. Right here you have a figure, uh, basically because the set of nerves that you see here, they're going to belong or they're going to be part of the solar plexus. That's all you need to know about this. There is autonomic nervous system, and the, within the autonomic nervous system, in the abdomen right here, you're going to have a set of nerves that they're going to radiate from the middle, and they're going to be also wrap around the aorta. This is going to be the uh, solar plexus. But that's all you need to know about that. You 
scroll down. Right here you see solar plexus. Okay, that's just in the abdomen. So if you scroll down, adrenal glands, it got to do with the solar plexus, that's why it's there. Parasympathetic division. So let's take a look at this. Parasympathetic division. Remember the sympathetic was thoracic? Take a look at the parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is at the top and at the very bottom. Cranial and lumbar. Another thing that you can look at is, for example, remember we said in the sympathetic, the green was short and the red was long? Well, in this case of the parasympathetic, the green one is long, the preganglionic is long, and the postganglionic is short. Okay, and you can see this again, parasympathetic is going to be at the very top cranial and at the very bottom lumbar. So, but if it's a cranial, what type of nerves do you have in the cranium? You have cranial nerves. That's why you can see right here that the parasympathetic components of the nerve are going to be part of the cranial nerve. So what cranial nerves are going to have a parasympathetic piece, a parasympathetic component? It's going to be oculomotor, which is cranial nerve number three, facial nerve, cranial nerve number seven, glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve number nine, and vagus, cranial nerve number 10. And you can see the vagus, as you know, it goes all the way down in order to innervate all these multiple different organs that we have. And those are gonna be part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you scroll down, right here, you're gonna see in there the cranial nerves, oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus, that they are gonna have a parasympathetic control of the nervous system. If you scroll down, you can see here, differences between sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? We said origin is thoracal lumbar, parasympathetic is cranial lumbar, right? Fiber lens, we say short if it's preganglionic, in the case of sympathetic, but long if it's preganglionic and parasympathetic. So those are the differences basically that I show you in those figures. The enteric nervous system, uh, in some books it says that the nervous system for the uh, intestines, for example, it's a separate group of nerves. However, in some other books, it says that it's not, that it's actually part of the autonomic nervous system. So we are not gonna discuss something that is not very clear what is the uh, definition of the enteric nervous system. So you can skip all that. If you scroll down, this, about, this is it for this part. Okay, the next topic is autonomic effects on target organs. We need to talk about trans neurotransmitters. Uh, I'm not sure if you need to know this, but uh, I can tell you the following. Look, we have parasympathetic and sympathetic, right? Those are the two divisions. So if you look in here, so then what is the neurotransmitter? Remember, this is preganglionic, we have acetylcholine. Postganglionic, acetylcholine. If you look at this other one, you can see acetylcholine preganglionic. Let's skip this for one second. If you scroll up again, you can see in here for the parasympathetic, acetylcholine, preganglionic, acetylcholine, postganglionic. So then, which one is which one is the most important or the, the most common neurotransmitter that you're going to have in the autonomic nervous system? Acetylcholine, in probably 80% of the cases. The other one, as you can see right here, is norepinephrine. So, but if you want to remember this, right, the answer is acetylcholine or norepinephrine. If you get a question about neurotransmitters in the case of the autonomic nervous system, and you don't remember exactly the answer, then you should pick acetylcholine because it's the most common one, as you can see, it's everywhere. Not only that, in the neuromuscular system, right, in the neuromuscular junction, I mean, you have also acetylcholine. So you should be okay if you have a question like this and you pick acetylcholine because chances are that that should be the answer. Only some exceptions, you will find that norepinephrine as an answer, okay? So which ones are the receptors? Since we said that acetylcholine is the most common one, the receptors for acetylcholine are gonna be muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. And in the case of norepinephrine, the receptors are gonna be alpha and beta receptors, as you can see down there. Okay, let's keep scrolling down. And right here you have the effects in the organs. Most of the time, the, or let's, let me rephrase that. In the case of the heart, for example, the parasympathetic slows down your heart, and the sympathetic speeds up your heart. So most of the time, the sympathetic is going to make things faster, okay? And the parasympathetic is gonna make things go slower, 
but that is true only in 70% of the organs, more or less. So in some other cases, it's not going to be true. It's going to be the other way around. So I'm not going to ask you what is the function of the uh, acetylcholine or the parasympathetic in the case of the piloerector muscle, for example. I'm not going to ask you that in your exam. As long as you know that you know the parasympathetic most of the time slows down and sympathetic speeds up things, that should be okay, at least for my exam. So you don't need to know that table and what is the action of every single type of uh, part of the autonomic nervous system in every single organ that we have. So if we're scrolling down, dual innervation. Oh, okay. Some organs need the sympathetic and the parasympathetic in order to activate or make the organ work. So in this case, if you see this is the pupil, the parasympathetic is going to produce uh, pupil constriction. Okay. And in the case of the sympathetic, it's going to dilate your pupil. So the pupils need the two types of autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic and sympathetic, in order to make it work. But there are some cases in which, as you can see here, control without dual innervation. In this case, it's basically one of them. Most of the time, this is going to be the sympathetic. So you have right here the sympathetic nervous system. As you can see here, sympathetic fibers. That is constantly making this blood vessel to shrink, make it smaller. Okay? So then the blood goes through it. When you want to dilate this, the stimulus is less. You see here the stimulus is more, so this is always constricted. So when you want to dilate, the stimulus is less and the blood vessel is going to dilate, as you can see right here. Okay, so in this case, this is, this is not dual control, this is just one control with more or less uh, stimulus. So if we just keep scrolling down, that's it for this part. Okay, the next topic is central control of the autonomic function. Central control refers to your brain. As you know, your brain controls everything in your body. So we cannot separate the autonomic nervous system even though we cannot control it you know, voluntarily but the brain still has control over that for example when i don't know when you're in love right your blood pressure increases your heart rate goes faster so that is because obviously your brain is going to make these things happen with the autonomic nervous system but you don't have control over it right so same thing happens when your high blood pressure goes up or when you are scared of something, your heart rate goes faster, you don't think about it, but your brain is going to do that. So that is, for example, in the case of the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex not only does that, other areas in your body do the same thing as well, such as your hypothalamus, your midbrain, your brainstem, and your spinal cord as well. And that's about it for this part.